You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is Lecture 6 of Practical Advice to Teachers by Rudolf Steiner, given on August 27th, 1919. You will have to be not only teachers at the Waldorf School, but also, if things turn out as they should, advocates of the whole Waldorf School system. For you will know the real purpose of the Waldorf School far more clearly than anyone who might try to explain it to either the more immediate or the wider public. So that you can be advocates in the right sense of what is striven for within the Waldorf School, and through it for cultural life in general, you will have to be in a position to defend it even against public opinions that are antagonistic or merely disapproving. Consequently, I must include in our discussions of teaching methods a chapter that follows quite naturally from what we have been discussing so far in these sessions. <clears throat> you know that in the field of education, as well as elsewhere, great results are expected nowadays of so-called experimental psychology. Experiments are carried out on people to determine what constitutes an individual's ability to form concepts or to memorize or even how their will functions. Naturally, elucidating the latter can be done only in a roundabout way, since willing is a process that takes place in a state of sleep. In the same way, the experiences of people during sleep can be determined only indirectly by means of electrical equipment in the laboratory and not by direct observation. Such experiments are actually conducted. Please do not think that I am wholly against such experiments. They can be meaningful as the feelers of science probing new fields like tendrils. Many interesting discoveries can be made by means of experimentation, and I certainly do not want to condemn it wholesale. I would be only too pleased if everyone who wanted to could have access to a psychological laboratory in which to conduct experiments. We must consider for a moment the rise of this experimental psychology, particularly in the form recommended by the educator Newman, who essentially belongs to the Herbartian school. Footnote Ernst Newman, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, M E U M A N N, 1862 to 1915, was a student of Wundt, a pioneer in experimental education. Herbartians were those who followed the philosophy of Johann Friedrich Herbart. 1776 to 1841, a German educator and philosopher who developed a metaphysical ideology of pluralistic realism, especially important for psychology, that rejected notions of faculties and innate ideas and constructed a full theory for a new kind of pedagogy. End of footnote. <clears throat> Why is experimental psychology practiced today? It is practiced because people have lost the gift of observing the human being directly. They can no longer rely on the forces that link, that inwardly connect one human being to another and also in the same way an adult to a child. Therefore they seek to find out by external means how to treat the growing child. You see how much more inward is the path we want to follow in our education and our teaching methods. This path is urgently needed for the present and also for the near future of humankind. On the one hand, we see the growth of this urge toward experimental psychology, and on the other hand, we also see how these very methods lead to a misconception of certain simple facts of life. Let me illustrate this by an example. Experimental psychologists have recently been particularly interested in what they call the process of comprehension, for instance, the process of comprehension in reading, in the reading of a given passage. In order to determine the nature of the process of comprehension, they have tried to work with people whom they designate, quote, experimental subjects, unquote. Put briefly, the very lengthy experiments take the following course. An experimental subject, a child or an older person, is presented with a written passage to read, and investigations are then made into what the child, for instance, should most profitably do first in order to achieve the most rapid comprehension. It is noted that the most expedient method is first to introduce the person to the subject matter of the passage. A further series of experiments shows that the experimental subject then carries out a process of quote, passive assimilation. Unquote. After the content has been introduced, it is then passively assimilated. Out of this passive assimilation of a written passage, 
is supposed to arise the faculty of quote, anticipatory learning, unquote, the ability to reproduce what was first introduced and then passively assimilated in a free spiritual activity. And the fourth act of this drama is then the recapitulation of all the points that are still uncertain, in other words, that have not entered fully into the person's life of soul and spirit. If you let the experimental subject carry out in proper sequence first the process of becoming acquainted with the content of the passage, then passive assimilation, then anticipatory learning, and finally recapitulation of whatever is not fully understood, you will come to the conclusion that this is the most expedient method of assimilating, reading, and retaining. Do not misunderstand me. I am putting this idea forward because I must. In order, in view of the fact that people talk at cross-purposes so much these days, it is possible to want to express an identical point with diametrically opposed words. <clears throat> Accordingly, the experimental psychologists will maintain that by such painstaking methods we can learn what we ought to be doing in education. But those who recognize more deeply the life of the human being as a whole know that you cannot arrive at a real educational activity by these means any more than you can put together a live beetle after you have dissected it. This is just not possible. It is equally impossible when you anatomize the human being's soul activity. Of course, it is interesting and in other connections can also be most fruitful to study the anatomy of human soul activity, but it does not make teachers. This experimental psychology will not, in fact, lead to a renewal of education, which can arise only out of an inner understanding of the human being. I had to say this lest you should misunderstand a statement I now want to make, a statement that will very much irritate those who are attached to the present-day climate of opinion. The statement is naturally one-sided in the way I shall put it, and its one-sidedness must, of course, be counterbalanced. What do the experimental psychologists discover when they have anatomized, or should we say tortured, for the procedure is not pleasant, the soul of their experimental subject? They have discovered what is, in their opinion, an extraordinarily significant result that is written boldly, again and again, in educational handbooks as a final conclusion. Put in clear language, the result, roughly, is that a passage to be read and learned is more easily retained if the content is understood than if it is not understood. To use the scientific idiom, it has been determined by research that it is expedient first to discover the meaning of a passage, for then the passage is easier to learn. Now I must make my heretical statement. If the conclusion of these experiments is correct, then I could have known it anyway. I should like to know what person, equipped with ordinary common sense, would not already realize that a passage is easier to remember if you have understood the sense of it than if you have not. There is no doubt that results of experimental psychology bring to light the most obvious truths. The truisms you find in the textbooks of experimental psychology are on occasion such that no one who has not been trained in the pursuit of science to accept the fascinating, along with the absolutely tedious, could possibly be persuaded to bother with them. People do in fact become inured to this kind of thinking even by the way they are drilled in their early school days, for the phenomenon is present even then, though it is less pronounced by far than in the universities. <clears throat> this heretical statement namely that you have to know the meaning of something that you are supposed to remember, is aimed particularly at teachers. But there is another point to consider. What is assimilated as meaning works only on the faculty of observation, the faculty of cognizing through thought. By laying emphasis on the meaning, we educate a person one-sidedly merely to observe the world, to know it through thought. If we were to teach only in accordance with that statement, the result would be nothing but weak-willed individuals. Therefore the statement is correct in a way, and yet not entirely correct. To be absolutely correct, we would have to say that if you want to do the best you can for an individual's faculty of cognizing, through thought, you would have to analyze the meaning of everything that the person is to take in and retain. It is indeed a fact that by first one-sidedly analyzing the meaning of everything, we can go a long way in the education of the human being's observation of the world but we would get nowhere in educating the will, for we cannot force the will to emerge by throwing a strong light on the meaning of anything. The will wants to sleep. It does not want to be awakened fully by what I might call the perpetual, unrestrained laying bare of meaning. 
It is simply a necessity of life that penetrates beyond the simple truth about the revelation of meaning and gives rise to the fact that we must also do things with the children that do not call for the elucidation of meaning. Then we shall educate their will. The unseemly practice of one-sidedly using the revelation of meaning has run riot. This can be seen particularly in movements like the Theosophical movement. You know how much I have protested over the years against a certain bad habit in Theosophical circles. I have even had to see Hamlet, a pure work of art, explained in Theosophical jargon. It is said that this represents manas, something else the I capital, and another the astral body. Footnote. Theosophists use manas to M-A-N-A-S to designate the mind principle which becomes dual when manifesting in the human constitution, thus dividing into a higher manas and a lower manas. End of footnote. One character is one thing, another something else. Explanations of this kind have been particularly favored. I have fulminated against this sort of practice because it is a sin against human life to interpret symbolically a work that is meant to be taken in directly to be taken in directly as pure art. A meaning is thus read into things in an unseemly fashion that raises them up as objects of mere observation to a position they should not occupy. All this stems from the fact that the theosophical movement is a decadent movement. It is the ultimate remnant of a declining culture, not something that has, in its whole attitude, anything to do with anthroposophy. Anthroposophy aims at the opposite, an ascending movement, the beginning of an ascent. This is radically different. That is why in the theosophical realm so much comes to the fore that is fundamentally a manifestation of extreme decadence. That there are people who can actually perpetrate the symbolical interpretation of the different characters in Hamlet, is the consequence of the atrocious education we have had and of the way we have striven to be educated only in the realm of meaning. Human life calls for more than education in the realm of meaning. It calls for education in what the will experiences in its sleeping condition, rhythm, beat, melody, harmony of colors, repetition, any kind of activity that does not call for a grasp of meaning. If you let children repeat sentences that they are nowhere near ready to understand because they are too young, if you make them learn these sentences by heart, you are not working on the faculty of understanding since you cannot explain the meaning that will emerge only later on. In this way you are working on the children's will, and that is what you should do, indeed you must do. On the one hand, you must try to bring to the children whatever is preeminently artistic, music, drawing, modeling, and so on. But on the other hand, you must introduce the children to things that have an abstract meaning. You must introduce them in such a way that even though the children cannot understand the meaning as yet, they will be able to do so later on, when they are more mature, because they have taken them in through repetition and can remember them. If you have worked in this way, you have worked on the children's will. You have also worked on the children's feeling life, and that is something you should not forget. Just as feeling lies between willing and thinking, and is and this is revealed from the point of view of both the soul and the spirit, so do the educational measures for the feeling life lie between those of the faculty of cognizing through thought and those for the will and its development. <clears throat> for thinking and knowing, we must certainly undertake measures that involve the revelation of meaning, reading, writing, and so on. For willed activity, we must cultivate everything that does not involve just the interpretation of meaning, but needs to be directly grasped by the whole human being, everything artistic. What lies between these two will work mainly on the development of the feeling life, of the heart forces. These heart forces are quite strongly affected if the children are given the opportunity of first learning something by rote, without understanding it, and without any explanations of the meaning, though, of course, there is a meaning. When they have matured through other processes, they will remember what they have learned and will then understand what they took in earlier. This subtle process must be very much taken into account in teaching if we want to bring up human beings who have an inward life of feeling. For feeling establishes itself in life in a peculiar manner. People ought to observe what goes on in this realm, but they do not do so effectively. 
let me suggest to you an observation that you can easily make with a little effort. Suppose you wanted to obtain a clear picture of the state of Goethe's soul in 1790. You can do so by studying just a selection of the works he produced during that year. There is a chronological list of all his poems at the end of every edition of his works. So you ponder the poems he wrote in 1790 and whatever plays he created. You call to mind that he finished his beautiful treatise, The Metamorphosis of Plants, that year, and you remember that he formulated the first ideas about his theory of colors. Out of all this you form a picture of his mood of soul in 1790, and you ask, what played into the soul life of Goethe in 1790? You will find the answer to this question only if you cast a searching look over everything that happened to Goethe from 1749 to 1790, and over, over all the events that followed from that year until his death in 1832. These are things that Goethe did not know then, but you know now. The remarkable realization emerges that Goethe's state of soul in 1790 was a combination of what was to come later, that is, what still had to be achieved, and what had gone before, that is, what had already been experienced. This is an extraordinarily significant observation. But people shy away from it, because it leads to realms that they understandably do not like to impinge on to make such observations. Try yourselves to observe in this way the soul life of a person whom you knew for some time and who has recently died. If you train yourselves to a more subtle observation of the soul, you will discover the following fact. Let us say that somebody who was your friend died in 1918. You knew the person for some time, and you can ask, what was his state of soul in 1912? Taking everything into account that you know of him, you will find that in his soul mood in 1912 the preparation for the death he was soon to meet was present. It played unconsciously into his feeling life at that time. The feeling life in its totality is what I call the mood of soul. A person who is soon to die has quite a different mood of soul from one who still has long to live. <clears throat> now you will understand why people are not eager to make such observations because to put it mildly, it would be rather uncomfortable to observe a person's imminent death expressed in his soul mood, and it is indeed expressed there. But for ordinary life it is not good for people to notice such things. That is why, on the whole, this kind of observation is removed from ordinary life, in the same way that the will, as a sleeping force, is disassociated from waking consciousness, even when we are awake. But the teacher must, after all, take up a position outside ordinary life to some extent. Teachers must not shrink from standing outside ordinary life and accepting for the sake of their work truths that may bring a shocking or tragic element to ordinary life. There is some lost ground to be recovered in this respect, especially in the educational system of Central Europe. You know how during the earlier decades of our educational life in Central Europe Teachers, especially in the grammar and middle schools, were still people who were rather looked down upon by the ordinary person. <clears throat> they were considered unworldly, pedantic people who did not know how to behave properly in society, always wore long frock coats instead of dinner jackets, and so on. These were at one time the teachers of young people, especially the more mature youngsters. Recently things have changed. University professors have begun to wear proper dinner jackets and even managed to get along quite well in the world, and the fact that the former state of affairs has been overcome is regarded as a great step forward. This is a good thing, but this state of affairs also needs to be transcended in another way. In future, this state of affairs must also be mastered in the sense that the way teachers stand outside life must not consist merely in always appearing in long frock coats when other people are wearing dinner jackets. They may, in a way, retain their position of being somewhat outside life, but this position should be linked with a deeper view of life than can be achieved by those who wear dinner jackets for certain occasions. I am speaking only figuratively, of course, for I have nothing against dinner jackets. <clears throat> Teachers must be able to regard life more profoundly, otherwise they will never succeed in handling the growing human being in an appropriate and fruitful way. They will have to accept certain truths like the one just mentioned. Life itself requires, in a certain sense, that it contain secrets. It is not discrete secrets that we need for the immediate future. In education we need knowledge of certain mysteries of life. The ancient teachers of the mysteries used to preserve such secrets as esoteric knowledge because they could not be imparted directly. 
In a certain sense all teachers must be in possession of truths that they cannot directly pass on to the world. The world that lives outside and does not have the task of educating the young would be confused in its healthy progress if it had daily access to such truths. You do not understand fully how to treat growing children if you are unable to discern the path that teachings take within them when you make them known in a way that the children cannot fully understand at their present stage of development. They will understand these teachings later, when you come back to them again and are then able to explain not only what you now tell them, but also what they took in earlier. This works very strongly on the heart forces. That is why it is essential in any good school that the teacher remain with a single group of students for as long as possible. The teacher takes them the first year, continues with them the following year, moves on again with them to the third year, and so on, as far as external circumstances will allow. And the teacher who has had the eighth grade one year should start again with the first grade the following year. It is sometimes appropriate to return only years later to something you have instilled into the children's souls. <clears throat> Whatever the circumstances, the education of the heart forces suffers if the children have a new teacher each year who cannot follow up what has been instilled into their souls in previous years. It is a feature of this teaching method that the teacher moves up through the grades with the same students. Only in this way can one work with the rhythms of life, and life has a rhythm in the most comprehensive sense. This is apparent in day-to-day -day life and the tasks we take up. If, for instance, you have become accustomed over the period of just one week to eating a roll and butter at half-past ten every morning, you will probably find that you are quite hungry for your buttered roll at the same time the second week. This is how easily the human organism adapts to rhythm. And not only the external organism, but the human being as a whole has a tendency to rhythm. For this reason it is beneficial throughout life, and that is what we are concerned with when we educate and teach children, to attend to rhythmical repetition. That is why it is useful to consider how quite specific educational motifs can be repeated year by year. Select lessons you want to take up with the children, make a note of them, and return to something similar every year. You can adhere to this pattern even in the more abstract subjects. In a manner suited to the children's nature, you teach addition in the first grade. In the second grade you come back to addition and to teach more as well. And in the third grade you return to it yet again. The same action is carried out repeatedly but in progressive repetitions. <clears throat> To enter the rhythm of life in this way is of the greatest importance for all education, far more important than perpetually emphasizing meaningful structure in your lessons so that you can quickly reveal everything significant in all that you have to offer. We can guess what this demand really means only when we have gradually developed a feeling for life. And then, by the very reason of being teachers, we shall avoid the external experimental approach that is so prevalent today, even in education. Once again I am pointing to these matters not in order to condemn them, but to improve certain aspects that have turned out to be detrimental to our spiritual culture. There are also educational textbooks on the results of memory experiments with experimental subjects. These people are treated in a peculiar manner. Experiments are carried out with them to determine the manner in which they retain something of which they know the meaning. <coughs> Then they are given a series of words that have no meaningful connection, and so on. Such experiments, seeking to determine the laws of memory, are practiced very extensively today. Discoveries are made that are formulated as scientific theses. Just as in physics, for instance, we have gay lussacs law, and so on, attempts are now made to register similar laws in experimental psychology and education. In accordance with a certain quite justifiable scientific yearning, Learned, dissertation, learned dissertations are expounded on the different forms of memory. First we have the memory type that assimilates with ease or with difficulty. Second, there is the type that finds it easy or difficult to reproduce what has been assimilated. You see that first, experimental subjects are tormented by the purpose of discovering that there are people who find it easy to memorize and others who find it difficult and then others are tormented in order to find out that there are those who find it either easy or difficult to recall what they have stored in their memories. In this way, through research, we now know that there are types of people who assimilate with ease or with difficulty, and that there are types who recall with ease or with difficulty what has been memorized. Third, there is the type of person who could be described as 
true and exact in their memory. Fourth, there is the person with comprehensive memory. And fifth, there is the type whose memory is retentive and reliable, as opposed to the one who easily forgets. All this very much accords with the yearning of modern science to classify. We are now armed with scientific results, and we can state what has been found out scientifically in the exact psychology of memory types. First, there is the type of person who assimilates with ease or with difficulty. Second, the one who recalls with ease or with difficulty. Third, the type who is true and exact. Fourth, the comprehensive type. And fifth, the retentive person who may remember things for years as opposed to one who forgets easily. I give all due respect to this scientific method of investigation that devotedly and very conscientiously maltreats countless experimental subjects and most ingeniously sets to work <clears throat> to obtain results so that we may know the types of memory that may be distinguished. Now also in the field of education, since psychological experiments with children have shown that it applies to them too. Parenthesis. Despite all true respect for this scientific method, I would nevertheless like to raise the following objection. Surely anyone endowed with sound common sense must know that certain people find it easy or difficult to memorize something or easy or difficult to recall something. We also know that others can repeat things truly and exactly, in contrast to those who muddle everything up. Still others have a comprehensive memory capable of retaining a long tale, as opposed to those who can memorize only something short. And finally, some people remember things for a long time, perhaps years, while others forget everything within a week. This is old, established knowledge as far as common sense is concerned. Yet it must be researched by scientific methods that inspire us all with respect, for it cannot be denied that they are very ingenious indeed. Two comments are applicable here. First, it is better to cultivate sound common sense in education than to enter into experimentation of this kind, which may very well develop ingenuity, but does not bring us any nearer to the individual characteristics of the children. Second, we may also say that our era is in a sorry plight indeed, if we have to assume that those who are to be teachers have so little common sense that they have to learn by such roundabout means of the existence of different types of memory. These certainly have to be regarded as symptoms of the state of our spiritual culture. I needed to draw your attention to these top topics, for you will find people saying to you, quote, So you have found a position at the Waldorf School. It is the most amateurish institution. They do not even want to hear about the greatest achievement of our time, namely experimental psychology. The professional thing to do is to take up these methods, whereas the way they teach at the Waldorf School is pure quackery. Unquote. You will have to realize that it will sometimes be necessary to recognize the relationship between science, which should not be any the less respected, and what must be built up on the basis of an inwardly oriented teaching and educational practice. This creates an inner loving attentiveness toward the child, as compared with the external relationships we learn about through experimentation. Certainly the inward quality has not entirely disappeared, indeed it is more prevalent than we might think, but it is in definite opposition to the scientific teaching that is increasingly being pursued. To a certain extent, it is true that the pursuit of scientific methods at the present time can destroy a great deal, but it has no power to drive out every remnant of sound common sense. Let this be our starting point. <clears throat> For if we cultivate it well, it will lead us to an inner relationship with what ought to happen in the le lessons we teach. We must realize that we are living at the beginning of a new age and that it is essential for us to be thoroughly aware of this fact. Up to the middle of the 15th century, surviving elements of Greco-Roman culture could still be felt. Since the middle of the 15th century, these elements have been no more than echoes. But those who even today live in these echoes still have the tendency in certain lower layers of their consciousness to hark back again and again to that Greco-Latin age that in its place was wholly admirable, but whose continuation today no longer has life. Think how self-satisfied people who have learned something are if they can explain to you. If you want to educate properly, they say, you must not only look at the rhythm and the rhyme of a poem, you must also give a suitable commentary as to the meaning. When you have properly introduced your students to the meaning, you will have reached the point at which they should actively take it into themselves. 
Even the ancient Romans, parenthesis, they will add after a long dissertation on the necessity of starting with an explanation of the poem, parenthesis, used to say, quote, rem tena verba sequantur, sorry, my Latin's not so good there, parenthesis, or excuse me, end quote, parenthesis, once you have understood a thing, the words follow naturally. I guess that's the translation, parenthesis. This is a tactic you will frequently encounter in people who consider themselves very learned and far above any dilettantism. First they expound on a subject as being the pinnacle of modern knowledge, and then they bolster their argument with the words of the ancient Romans. Of course, to be able to quote in Greek is a sign of supreme scholarship. For the fourth post-Atlantean period, this attitude was the right one, but it is not in keeping with our own time. The ancient Greeks did not send their children to school to learn ancient Egyptian. They made them learn Greek. But we today first introduce our children to ancient languages. This is a fact that must be understood. The end of Lecture 6